Let's get back to work. Okay, so we have been talking about speciation. So, and I said, I've made the distinction between micro and macro evolution. Speciation is the bridge from the processes that occur within a species, uh, from the processes that occur within a species to the processes that occur between species. Okay? So now we're talking about the big picture of evolution. So we need to understand how we can study the past, how we can reconstruct uh, the past. Um, so that's what I want to do uh, today. Thank you. So, here's the history of life. that Moe's going the other way. Poor Homer. 3.5 billion year journey. What took you so long? That's the history of life, folks, as seen through the eyes of Homer Simpson. So, and, and what we're going to address for the rest of today's class is how do we know that? How can we reconstruct uh, the history of life? How can we reconstruct the history of life as seen through macro evolution? This is micro evolution, change of alleles within a population. This is macro evolution, change among species. So there are two ways we're going to do this. The first is phylogenetic reconstruction. The second is the fossil record. So I'm going to start with a discussion of phylogenetic reconstruction. Then we'll talk about fossils very briefly. Um, now, phylogenetic reconstruction, I've already talked about this. This is, what we're going to do is reconstruct the structure of the tree of life, of the family tree of life, starting with the things that we have today. So it's going to be based on similarity. So we take a human and a chimpanzee. And they, we say, they're pretty similar, so they have a recent common ancestor. We have a human, chimpanzee, and a cow. Cow is kind of different, so that's going to have an older common ancestor. Then we're going to have a fish. That's going to have an even older common ancestor. Okay? So what we're doing is creating a nested hierarchy of relationships. And what I would normally do, I mean, the intuitive way to do this is this, and what I've essentially done in describing that thought experiment with humans, chimpanzees, cows, and fish, is this. We're going to look at the two species and say, how similar are they? If they're very similar, they had a recent common ancestor because they've only had a little amount of time to evolve apart. If they're very different, they probably had a rather ancient common ancestor. So let's do that. So, and this, by the way, this is an approach to phylogenetic work called phonetics based on overall similarity. So here's something that happened in evolution. This is what actually happened. Uh, there's a common ancestor for butterflies and moths, which is more recent than the common ancestor of wasps. Okay? So let's do a reconstruction on the basis of overall similarity. Well, look, it's obvious. Butterflies and moths are very similar. Wasps are rather different, so this is correct, right? But this method doesn't always work, okay? Here's another 
set of organisms. This is what actually happened in evolution. We have a split here into the sharks and rays. These are the um, cartilaginous fish. And here's the bony, bony fish. Okay? These are what most other fish are. Okay? So there's an early split, then a later split between these guys. But look at this. A shark and a normal fish are fairly similar. This guy's weird, right? Pretty damn weird thing, rays, right? So, if we do it on the basis of overall similarity, I'm going to put the shark and the bony fish next to each other because they're more similar to each other, and this guy out here. This is wrong, okay? So, my point is that using this overall similarity approach can be misleading. Why? Because we have differences in the rate of evolution. Implicit to this idea that overall similarity is informative is the fact that evolution proceeds at a monotonic, uniform, constant rate. It does not. Let's see what happened. So, here we have our problem. Here's our family tree. This is what actually happened. Remember that sharks and rays are closely related, okay? Um, and each red bar is an evolutionary event, an evolutionary innovation, okay? What I want to point out is you've got a lot of red bars here. So this is fast evolution produce this weird ray thing, okay? So that's what's caused us the problem. There's been rather little evolution along here, rather little evolution along here, lots of evolution along here. Okay? So this, the intuitive way to reconstruct phylogeny is through phonetics on the basis of overall similarity can be misleading if we have very different rates of evolution. So let's take a different approach. This is called cladistics. And now we're going to focus on particular shared characteristics, okay? We're going to take three, this is again what actually happened in evolution, we're going to take three species, a horse, a human, and a lizard, okay? And we're going to take, instead of just looking at overall similarity, we're going to look at particular characters, and I've just chosen at random two characters. One is the number of toes, horses have one toe, humans have five, lizards have five, and blood temperature. Humans and horses are both ma mammals, so we have warm blood. Lizards have cold blood. Now, let's use ancestral characters. Why do I say ancestral characters? What I mean is these are ancient characters. The five fingers is an ancient character. Remember we talked about this before. The first tetrapod, the first amphibian had five fingers, okay? So uh, this is the innovation. Horse having one is the innovation, okay? Now, what have we done? This has put humans and lizards together. Well, that's obviously wrong, right? Humans are more closely related to horses. We're both mammals than we are to lizards. So this is wrong. Now let's do it on derived characters. What is a derived character? Derived character is an evolutionary novelty. In this case, the horse having one toe is an evolutionary novelty. That's a derived character. Having five toes is an ancestral character. What's the ancestral character here? Well, cold-bloodedness, right? Warm-bloodedness is a new invention. So, if we take shared new invention, shared derived characters, that puts humans and horses together. So the way in which we do phylogenetic reconstruction is on the basis of shared derived characters. Shared derived characters is the basis for phylogenetic reconstruction. Okay? And this uh, process is known as cladistics. So, these are shared derived characters which define different groups. So here's the group tetrapods, which have the tetrapod limb. Uh, here's the amniotes, which have a particular type of egg. 
And then this is a, a uh, shared derived character for birds. Okay? Uh, so, in other words, all the descendants of a single common ancestor in which feathers first arose are here and they're birds. Okay? Shared derived characters are our key to, uh, to uh, phylogenetic groupings. Everyone with me? Good. Everyone awake? Oh, no, Dr. Berry, I'm asleep. Well, that's good. Um, now, these days, we apply, what I've been talking about, obviously, is morphological, anatomical characters. We use the same logic in thinking about molecular data. And most phylogenetic reconstruction these days is with DNA sequence. Okay? And so here's a group of closely related species. Humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, orangs, these are macaques, and spider monkeys. Okay? Uh, macaques, sorry, rhesus monkeys. Um, and you've just lined up some DNA sequence. This is from a particular gene, okay? And by the way, quite a lot of gene. This is 5,000 base pairs of sequence along here, but we've only highlighted the points where they're different. Almost the entirety of these sequences are identical, okay? Ah! She was texting to her friend, this is a really exciting lecture, you should be here. But, um, and what we have here are shared derived characters. So this is an innovation, a derived state, a new character having an A at position 3913. So that unites the great apes, orangs, gorillas, uh, chimpanzees, and humans. So, here, so in other words, here's the phylogeny, humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangs. This A arose here in this common ancestor. Okay, and therefore it's it's shared by all these descendant species. Sorry, it's a bit faint on this slide, but here's uh, a derived character G and G instead of T at position 6,367, which is shared, derived, and shared between humans and chimpanzees. In other words, that arose in the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. That arose here and is present, therefore, only in these two species. Okay? That's the logic of phylogenetic reconstruction. Is everyone comfortable with that? Good. Um, and obviously the details are completely unimportant. Now, with enormous amounts of DNA sequence, we have incredible power, incredible power to reconstruct the history of life, okay? And this is from molecular data. Um, in the past 20 years, we've completely reconfigured our understanding of life. So there are three major groups in life. This is us, animals. We're just one little tip, okay? Most of the family tree belongs to the two other groups, Bacteria and archaea. We barely knew about the archaea until about 20 years ago when we could start uh, DNA sequencing. Now, this actually makes sense. Remember I told you that life originated 3.5 billion years ago? And as we'll discuss uh, on uh, Monday, animals really, evolved, animals that you're familiar with, uh, fish, jellyfish, mammals, they only, well, mammals were much later, but um, they only really came into being about half a billion years ago. So for the first three billion years of life, life was microbial, okay? And that's what happened, okay? You've got this enormous diversification of microbes into these two groups, the bacteria and the archaea, and then you've got these complex cells, the eukaryotes, which as you know probably are uh, if you like, collaborations between multiple microbes. So a eukaryotic cell has a mitochondrion, which was once upon a time a microbe. These more complex cells are much more recent. Okay? So, that's one approach to understanding uh, the history of life. 
We reconstruct the history of life from the tips, if you like, of the tree. Uh, the other way is the fossil record. The fossil record, and folks, this is fantastic. The fossil record is an amazing thing. Uh, there's no sort of rule in life that there has to be a relic of past animals and plants left in rocks. But there is. We have them. They're extraordinary things. I mean, that's amazing. This thing died 200 million years ago. And there it is, captured in its death. Extraordinary thing. And this is even older. This is a green sand fish. Here's a, here's a trilobite that lost its head, very unfortunate. Um, and some of these things, some of the, it depends what you consider a fossil, but I consider this a fossil. Everyone know what this is? This is an amber insect. Uh, what happened here is this insect was crawling up a tree trunk. Da -de da -de da -de da. Okay, a long time ago. And some sap came out, some resin came out of the tree. The insect was stuck in it. Ah, ah da, da, da. And then more sap came out. And so it's absolutely entombed in the sap. And then the sap uh, mineralizes to become amber. And you have trapped insect from ancient history. It's truly remarkable. The fossil record is a fantastic thing. Um, and, you know, so you have Jurassic Park, of course. Now, where do fossils come from? Who's talking? I hate you. Good. Just check. <laughs> um, just to remind you, and you probably know this, uh, where do fossils come from? This is all I want you to know about geology. Um, this is the process, you know, earth processes. You've got uh, volcanism. You've got the plates, one going under the other. The important thing is that you've got magma being produced from the volcanoes and the magma will cool to form igneous rocks and then you will get chemical and pressure to change the igneous rocks into metamorphic rocks and so on and so forth. What's important from our point of view is that these rocks, these rocks, everything erodes. So you're getting tiny particles of all these rocks being washed into rivers, washed into lakes, washed into the ocean, and they you get layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of mud, which will eventually condense to form sedimentary rocks. And it is in sedimentary rocks that we find uh, fossils. Um, and I won't go into the actual process of fossilization, but it's really amazing. So here's your dead Archaeopteryx. It's fallen into a river, it's, so it's now being stuck under layers of mud, okay? And you will get, and they vary, they're various processes of fossilization, but you can have atom for atom replacement of the organic material of the animal or plant with uh, mineral process, uh, with mineral uh, atoms. Really remarkable. And just to remind you, the findings are stunning. This is an elephant who stood beside an elephant. Elephants are massive. Look, that's me. That's a full-grown man. That's an elephant. We're, I'm pretty puny. But look at these things. These are to scale. They're just stunning. It's extraordinary. There is no way without the fossil record we would ever guess that anything that big that monstrous could have existed on the planet. It's really remarkable. And as I say, it's all born of this process where you get literally the replacement molecule by molecule of organic material with mineral material. And then of course, it will erode out. So suddenly this thing, which was buried in a block of rock, is now visible and we can collect the fossil. Now. Inevitably, this means, given the nature of fossilization, that our fossil record is a biased view into the history of life. Ideally, we would have a situation where, say, one in every million organisms was fossilized. 
So it's a perfect, it's a, it's a limited sample, but a perfectly um, uh, representative sample. But that's not how it works. For two things, there's some environments that are more likely to form fossils, right? Um, I don't have any chalk here. I don't have a black, I guess I'll use this. Ooh. Sorry, just trying to keep people awake. Um, normally I do it with chalk, and you can throw that pretty hard because it's not very heavy. But um, So the first bias in the fossil record is the fact you've got to have hard parts. okay? Because if you're just soft and squishy, you'll probably be eaten by bacteria before there's any opportunity to, uh, for fossilization. So obviously vertebrates are going to be overrepresented in the fossil record because we have nice hard bones. Mollusks are going to be overrepresented in the fossil record because they have nice hard shells. Okay? That's one. Two, if I live in a lake, which is a sedimentary environment, I'm likely to be fossilized. If I live in a desert where there's no uh, sedimentation occurring, I'm never going to fossilize. So it's important you understand that even though the fossil record is a wonderful resource, it's very biased and, and very incomplete. Okay? Um, this is the geological column. You should all be basically familiar with these uh, time periods. Okay? These were created using fossils. Okay? So these, these, are, these are designated by geologists, these geological periods, using fossils. And, well, let's take Let's, take, let's go forward, a simple example. Um, here is the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Famously, this is where about 66 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. So the reason we have a boundary there is if I'm in Turkey and I'm looking at a fossil, a bunch of fossils through time, I'm finding dinosaur, 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 no dinosaur, no dinosaur, no dinosaur. Okay. The cool thing is, I can now go to Australia, and I'm looking at a similar set of rocks, and dinosaur, 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 no dinosaur, no dinosaur, no dinosaur. Okay. I know that that horizon there is the same time in Australia as it was in Turkey. Okay. So it's these transitions in fossil types which are key landmarks in creating the geological column. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this, uh, and you certainly don't need to know this, but it's actually kind of cool when you think of the full history of life as revealed by the fossil record. So, it's 3.5 billion years ago we have the origin of life. Then, as I we wait 3 billion years before our major group, the chordates, appears. Um, then we've got very simple fish. Then we've got fish with jaws. This is a biggie. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. The first amphibians, that's out of water. Uh, 365, maybe 375 million years ago. Then you've got reptiles coming from amphibians. Now you've got some mammal-like reptiles. Then you've got mammals. Mammals evolved about the same time as dinosaurs, 210 million years ago. Then they've become uh, more sophisticated mammals. Um, loss of dinosaurs. And then you're getting apes. You've got the first hominids. And then this is our immediate ancestor, 2 million years ago. Um, and then finally, yes! We've got us. As revealed by the fossil record. Now, how about, how can we interpret fossils? They're, they're two dimensions, they tend to be crushed, they, they're incomplete, we've only got the bones. How can we make biological inferences about them? I want to just tell you, show you a quick movie clip of a kind of cool reconstruction about this fossil. This is a dinosaur bird fossil called Microraptor gui from China. And look at it, it's weird. So these are feathers, clearly flying feathers, 
But it's got flying feathers on its hind legs as well as on its forelegs. I mean, these are clearly wings of a sort. What was it doing with this? I just want to show you how these days you can actually create a pretty good reconstruction. A scientific sculptor starts work on bone by bone reconstruction of the entire skeleton. Jason Rome is an artist and a trained anatomist. We have more than 16 specimens to look at, so many of these bones I could see from not on both sides, but from end on and from all different positions. Some specimens have already been analyzed in detail by other scientists. So I would just sit there with my, my crown and check and make sure that what I was sculpting not only looked like the picture, but that it met those measurements. Since the specimens are all slightly different sizes, each bone is scaled to match the dimensions of the original fossil, a process that takes months. It's hard work to sit down and look at every bone from every angle. It's grueling, in fact. My wife says I have a lot of tolerance for tea. I guess that must be true. <laughs> One way to find out is to create a model that can be flown in a wind tunnel to see how it performs. And for that, they'll need more than a skeleton. Jason Brown builds up the body form one muscle at a time, guided by published science on dinosaur anatomy. To estimate the animal's mass and center of gravity, the sculpture is CAT scanned and computer modeled with internal organs. Mick Ellison reconstructs the feathering of the wings and tail. He traces the feather impressions from eight different specimens, scales them to the same size, and makes a composite that combines all the information from all the fossils and reveals the shape of the wings. Then model builders John Allen and Paul Train take the knowledge accumulated by the science team. The arrangement of feathers on the wings. The range of motion in the limbs. The body shape. Its mass and center of gravity. And build a jointed feathered model that can be posed in the various postures it might have used in flight. So then... And this is cool. They can test the model in a wind tunnel. But now he pitches an idea of his own. It's a bit unorthodox and takes a while to sink in. But eventually they come around. Why would you say this is a perfect idea? Shu's idea is to extend the legs almost straight back allowing the leg and foot feathers to form a canopy over the tail. That's your analysis. That's a possible possibility. <laughs> possible? <laughs> but that would not be a lifting synthesis. Well, that's an interesting one. Jumps off the tree as it jumps its legs are already behind it. It 
was able to dive, it's got a nice uh, glide ratio going, and then when it gets ready to land, it starts bringing its legs gradually forward through the flight plane configuration. And then as it brings its legs all the way forward, it's able to pitch up and land on a tree. So the ultimate glide story is going to be this transition from the legs all the way back to the legs all the way forward, which gets you very nicely from the top of the tree to the bottom of the next tree. I think that's a, a beautiful case study in how you can take that crushed, two-dimensionalized piece of flattened, dead, 150-year-old rock and turn it into something which is, I mean, they might be wrong, but they've done some really interesting and smart science to try and figure out what's going on with that thing. So with this kind of reconstruction, you can ask really probing questions about big events in the history of life. And this is perhaps one of the biggest. What happened about 365, 370, 375 million years ago, which saw fish come out onto land? That's a huge transition. Here's a uh, baseball cartoon. Uh, and rather recently, uh, we've discovered this so-called walking fish. Uh, the fossil looks like this. It's really remarkable. And again, I'm just going to show you a short video clip that explains the story of the discovery and why it's so impressive. I remember thinking to myself, while well, this is going on, where do we get a load of this? Because it's just so beautiful. Darwin believed that evidence for his idea of common ancestry would be unearthed in the form of transitional fossils. For example, if over millions of years, fish gave rise to land animals, as evolutionary theory predicts, we should find fossils of extinct creatures that are part fish and part land animal. In 1999, paleontologist Neil Schubert and his colleagues set out to find just such a creature. What evolution enables us to do is to make specific predictions about what we should find in the fossil record. The prediction in this case is clear cut. That is, if we go to rocks of the right age and rocks of the right type, we should find transitions between two great forms of life, between fish and amphibian. Many scientists think life began in the water, at least three and a half billion years ago. More recently, about 375 million years ago, the tree of life branched as primitive fish evolved into amphibians, such as today's frogs and salamanders, which live part of their lives on land. Armed with this prediction, Schumann and his colleagues organized an expedition to one of the most desolate places on Earth, the Canadian Arctic, about 500 miles from the North Pole, where rocks of just the right age are exposed. Here, they hope to fill a gap in the branch of the evolutionary tree that leads from primitive fish to animals with four limbs, or tetrapods, by finding a fossil of an animal that shared the characteristics of both. But after three summers of digging through hundreds of tons of rock in this harsh environment, they had found little of interest. They returned the next year for one last try. Money was running out. This was it. We were told this was our last year out there. And then in 2004, on the third day of the season, a colleague of mine was removing rock and discovered a little snout sticking out the side of the cliff, just like exactly like this. And he removed more rock and more rock and more rock, and it became clear this was a snout of a flathead animal. And that's when we knew flathead animal, 375 million years old. This is going to be something interesting. They called it Tiktaali, which means large freshwater fish in the language of the local Inuit people. And it's one of the most vivid transitional fossils ever discovered, showing how land animals evolved from primitive fish. Over here we have a fish about 380 million years old. And we see some angry fish that has scales on its back and fins. You compare that to an amphibian, you find a creature that doesn't have scales. And it's modified the fins to become limbs, uh, arms and legs. And it has, a, it has a flat head with the eyes on top and a neck. What we see when we look at the fossil record that rocks in just the right age is a creature like Tiktaalik. Just like a fish, it has scales on its back 
and the fin, as you can see the fin webbing here. And when we look at the head, we see something very different. We see a very amphibian like thing with a flat head with eyes on top. It gets even better when we take the fin apart. When we look inside the fin, as in this cast here, what you'll see is bones that compare to our shoulder, elbow, even parts of the wrist, bone for bone. So you have a fish at just the right time in the history of life that has characteristics of amphibians and primitive fish. It's amazing. Pretty cool, folks. Um, and that's what I want to leave you on. That's a beautiful instance of what the fossil record can tell us that nothing else can tell us. There it is, documented in the rock at exactly the pre predicted time. The transition, a major transition in the history of life from life in water to life on land. Okay, guys, I will see, well, I will see you on Sunday as I'm coming to Gilly Bolly with you. So please... Uh, see that as an opportunity to ask me questions. And after that, I will see you on Monday.